Hey guys, welcome back to Studio Time. And this Studio Time is uh, a new one uh, in the series. And this time we're going to focus on modal engines. So this is the first one of the modal engine series. It's quite a long one, but it's a good one. Uh, so stay tuned for this one. So in this episode, I want to talk about um, uh, writing a suite, uh, producing it, recording it, uh, mixing it when you have when you're done with the recordings and all in the whole thought process behind it and what you then are going to do with that suite so let me talk about that a little bit um, oh I have to say too that uh, I got a slap on the hands over the last couple of studio times because I was too explanatory what happened in the film uh, spoiler alert and I was also too explanatory in my marker section which already explained what was going to happen in the movie. So I got a slip over the wrist. So we're going to dial that down for this uh, series. So, Mortal Engines, you can see the trailer and you can see what, what's happening in the film. And uh, this week it's also coming out in the theaters. So you guys should go see it and then you know what's happening in the movie. So then when you watch the studio times, it all makes sense out of the blue. So what we're going to talk about here is a, a theme, a suite, that is related to London. Uh, London is one of the major protagonists in this uh, movie with a character that's uh, uh, two characters that three actually characters that are connected to uh, London. Um, so it was one of the more important themes that I needed to write. And what I do at that specific point is that, yes, I start playing around on the piano a little bit. It's just like, do I want this? Do I want that? But I'm also thinking about it a lot, like what, what, do you, what do I think this city needs, uh, London? Cities on wheels, that much is already known about a model engine, so I can freely say that. London is a, a major city on wheels and it's covering the earth for uh, oil, for um, water, for food, uh, slaves, uh, whatnot. Um, so I was analyzing London, I was analyzing England and the way that it is portrayed in the, in, in the movie. And a couple of things uh, came to mind. Uh, one was uh, the English culture is a very rich culture and it's very old. Um, but it's also a culture um, potentially a little bit on a decline uh, with, um, you know, uh, Brexit, uh, uh, for instance, right now, we don't want to get too political at this point. Uh, but this happened a few times in history, too. Um, and it's kind of happening in this movie too. So I thought it was important that it had, it felt like it had a really rich culture, um, but also that um, it's maybe a little over, a little over the edge. Um, and secondly, I was thinking about uh, uh, the aggression in this movie uh, carried out by, uh, by the city of London. Um, so that needed to have an element too. And I was thinking about soccer uh, and, and soccer fans and the craziness and the aggression sometimes that comes with that, with, with hooliganism. Um, obviously, alcohol is a, is a big part of that as well. So, I, you know, all these elements needed to be part of this, of this suite. At the same time, uh, nobility. Um, the English culture is a very noble culture. Um, uh, we only need to think about, you know, um, uh, the, the the wars that we uh, that we had uh, in uh, in Europe, but also um, b um, the way that the characters are portrayed in the in this movie. So especially one character that turns out to be one of the one of the heroes. So nobility was very important about the uh, about this movie too. Um, so if we just stick with these three elements, I was just thinking, you know, what can we do and how can we go about it. Then I started researching a lot of things online. Then I found out that um, I knew a few things, but not a lot of it, that almost like every aspect in uh, the English um, rich military history, um, almost every aspect of the English uh, military has like its own theme, you know, just like a brass band theme. And a lot of these themes are based on whatever um, English composers wrote, but it is also heavily influenced by um, some uh, German music as well, uh, Alder Wagner, uh, Bruckner, um, you know, the really big orchestral brassy uh, sounds. So I started researching, researching all these things and then, you know, um, undoubtedly you, you come across like these very uh, famous uh, players in classical music and famous pieces of music. Uh, there's um, 
Symphonie Fantastique by uh, Berlioz. There's uh, the, the Ride of the Valkyrie. Um, and then there's uh, um, uh, the, the, the Planets by, uh, by Holst. Um, so there's a lot of pieces that are rooted in, in um, English uh, music that then was written for, for these um, military aspects and, and brass bands. So I'm not a connoisseur on that, on that whole uh, subject, but this is kind of what I picked up on it. So I listen a lot to these things and that was kind of became very important for London. So let me now just go to the piano. And um, I was playing around with this, with this idea and eventually that's what it, what it became. Um, was to do something with brass that was very simple. It was an idea of... It's like a very simple idea. When you play it like that, it sounds terrible. Um, but when you actually pro start programming it with horns, with really crazy strings uh, against it, um, it becomes actually uh, interesting. And I, I, I mixed it with... Um, some military drums, some machinery sounds, because we're talking about a big city on wheels. Um, so I just want to play you a bit of what I programmed here, and then I will skip um, to, through the suite where this, this particular theme um, just comes back a, a, a few times. Um, and then down the line, we're going to talk about certain cues um, that have this theme like worked in. Okay, so enough talking. Uh, let's play some music. So I'm just going to go to my suite. I'm just going to start somewhere in the suite uh, just before this theme starts. Um, I'm just going to let it play for a little bit and then um, uh, I'm going to take you to the later part in the suite and then play something from that. So let's just listen here. I uh, just want to make sure that my tracks are not on solo and my screen is there. Uh, let's see. Let me play the section of the suite where um, the brass theme is about to come in. So here we go. Okay, so let me let me stop it right there. Um, so that's the initial uh, statement of the theme. Very simple. I'm going to skip to a different part in the suite where that thing now comes back arranged differently. Uh, so let's play this section till the end, and then we're just going to see what's going on here.
Okay, let me stop there. Um, um, you have no idea, by the way, how different this sounds when you hear the real recording uh, of this at the very end of this uh, episode. Quite a difference, if I might say. Uh, now that I hear this back in the programming, I'm just like, wow, who, <laughs> who approved this? Um, but, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm building my own brass library, because for stuff like this, it's so hard to get it uh, programmed right with the right intention aggression, but also with that uh, pop, 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 you know, that attack and, and, the, um, and the feeling that comes with that. Anyway, different subject. So let's now go over what we played. Um, uh, so we started um, with the initial uh, statement of the theme, uh, which I explained uh, to you, which is um, um, a little bit like Wagner-esque. Um, it's also very uh, Berlioz-esque. Uh, so I'm just going to go to my uh, horn parts right here and just uh, solo this thing. So super in in major uh, C major in this in this case, um, and you know it took me a little bit of uh, programming tricks to get this to sound right. So. I used here the long horns, but I actually doubled it with uh, with um, uh, staccato horns to get like a somewhat realistic um, uh, sound out of it. Um, it goes together with a lot of timpanis and some uh, grueling sound design. I don't want to get into that aspect right now. I just want to go into the into the thematic side of things. <clears throat> so that's how we started, um, and then when it comes back a little later, um, there's a pretty full brass arrangement that goes with it. So if I solo that section right here. So there we hear uh, praying the brass together. So it's still like the, uh, the horns carrying the, uh, the theme with the trombos, bass trombones really playing big majestic chords underneath. But the interesting thing that goes with it are the, the string runs. Um, now, I would say the most amount of improvement with the live recording is especially this part, because this is hard to program. Um, but there is a, a, a library that gives you really good options for that, which is the, the Berlin String Library, um, which is my library of choice when it comes to really fast programming uh, stuff. It has this run mode uh, built into it, which is uh, really nice. Let me play that section for you. So those are the runs. I mean, it still it sounds pretty good when it when it when it's it's programmed. But wait until you hear the the live guys and the the wind of those uh, strings against the um, uh, melodic brass really gives that majestic uh, feeling uh, for London. Like I said, um, um, this is uh, very much like exercised uh, throughout the the centuries. And good examples are the, uh, the Valkyrie and and the um, Berlioz. Uh, Symphony Fantastique, big brass section, a lot of fast strings, so just creating uh, something uh, majestic. Um, so when we switch to the back end of it, um, we hear uh, another theme uh, that uh, comes in. Uh, first, we start with a minor version of that uh, same theme. So we still hear the similar string runs, but now the whole brass is in minor. <laughs> So here we see now the, the, the theme being played in minor uh, on the lower brass with the, with the same uh, staccato technique, uh, long technique in the, in the brass. And, and the string runs now together with the woodwinds also playing these runs um, to a certain extent. Let me just go in that. I mean, there's a, oh, here we go. Um, so these are extra woodwinds that I programmed on top, but um, like I said, life, it's such a different ball game. So while the other things are playing this then, it adds that really nice uh, spice to it. Spice to it. You 
and you got to hear how that sounds live. It sounds so much better. Um, but anyway, that's what I at least uh, programmed. And then um, when um, we get here, um, we have a second theme uh, coming in. Uh, let me focus on that for a second. Um, Okay, no, this is still the same theme. Uh, so um, here we go back to major and we're now uh, setting up uh, the theme that comes in here. Then it starts building up to the to the the other theme that you've already heard. Um, so this is a theme that is uh, part of the London theme, but then it breaks off on its own and it becomes a theme for a different character. So I will discuss this in a separate video. So I'm not going to talk too much about this uh, theme. Um, and then it kind of comes back and gets like reiterated. And then the most fun part of it for me is the slowdown at the end where I play the theme, but now with the uh, descending bass line. So let's quickly uh, go there, um, which is this section right here. Okay, let me stop right here. Uh, so here we hear that same theme again. But then we see um, the ascending. Textbook easy. Um, so uh, it works really well with the with the theme, and then here's the counter line with the with the three trumpets that plays against it. You don't hear them that well when they're programmed, but the the live guys sounded sounded absolutely fantastic. Um, so um, now that we got to this point, you know you have this whole suite. What happens then? Well, you know you send it out, obviously. And what I do usually is that before I send something out, while I'm writing something. I would send the director or the producers or the studio an email saying like, hey, what about this? Do you think this could potentially work in the, in the theme? And then they would give me a response saying like, yeah, that could work or, oh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. Um, so there's always things that I send to them in the form of a question to figure out whether I'm going somewhere good with this. So when I, um, when I said to them, you know, I was thinking maybe something in the style of uh, the Ride of the Valkyrie or maybe um, a Symphony Fantastique. And then I sent it some clips uh, to them, YouTube clips, and they were sending me three thumbs up back. Just it's like, okay, that, that was a good decision to go there. So then you emphasize that potentially more in your music. And then you talk about things like, oh, you know, would you like to hear like some strong rhythm in it, almost like engines running at the same time? And then I got three thumbs up back. And so you constantly try to. And I've also sent out ideas that they thought it was not a good idea, but we'll talk about that in a different video. Um, so that's how you try stuff out. And then I, I send it the, 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 the whole suite to them. And then, you know, you have to wait like a couple of days and then feedback comes back like, Oh, you know, it's great, or we want to do this, or we don't understand this, or we don't understand that. Uh, so there were a few, few suites where they had quite some questions, actually, and, and doubts whether it was the right choice, but we'll talk about that in a different video. Um, with this particular theme, though, they were super happy with, like right from the start. It was the first thing that I wrote, and immediately they were like, wow, this is so great for... Uh, that city and the characters on that city. So when you get that back, then you know like, okay, this is something really cool and really strong. Um, and then you dive deep into it more uh, to 
emphasize certain things that they really like and potentially what they don't like, you take it out. Uh, so in this case, um, I'm just going back to the computer. Now I thought it was potentially time to um, add like some more sound design uh, elements uh, to them. Uh, so I can go over them like in the, in the section that's actually part of the theme. Um, there's a percussion element of that uh, section that eventually then became its own action music cue. You will hear that uh, later when I um, uh, play the final recordings back. Uh, but let me play that section a little bit. Uh, it starts somewhere around here and then it switches into that section. So here we go. So this particular little section, uh, funny enough, which is only like four bars in pretty much a suite of like half an hour to 45 minutes, that eventually became its own action suite, his act, its own action uh, music into the film. And um, you'll hear that in the final recording when we're done talking about this suite. Okay, the other thing that's important for London, obviously, is the Big Ben. Um, so I took a clock sound and did like a bunch of different resamples on it. So this might be a good time just to go a little bit over the sound design that I then added uh, to this cue. Um, so let's go to that uh, clock sound. Um, so here I have one together with some sound design. That's a normal one. So there's some sound design uh, sitting uh, behind it. <clears throat> I'm going to turn my speakers a little down. Um, then we're going to move uh, to a different sound here. Let's see what I have here. That's actually a sound that I made with that piano that I've made a long time ago for 300 Rise of an Empire. Um, and then this is interesting. This is like uh, some sound design done on those uh, string runs that comes back and goes in and out throughout uh, the, the suite, but also in the, in the movie. So here we hear them being filtered up. And they actually morph in a really nice way into the acoustic ones at that point, which is very clear at the very end of the video when I play the, the final recording of it. Now, let's see what we have uh, here. So that was made with a piano too, uh, funny enough. Uh, then I double it with a bunch of explosions, apparently. Uh, let's see what that sounds like. Oh yeah, I use that as an accent on the one. <clears throat> and then I double it with um, uh, a bunch of gongs. Uh, I here have a, a, a saw synth sound that I'm, that I'm using. Uh, what I do here, uh, there's um, uh, some resamples here. Let's check this out. So I use that to accent uh, the things on the one. Uh, let's see what I have here. This is some more piano resamples. That's a pretty cool sound. I've used that a, a few times in the in the movie too, so you will hear it back in 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 other cues. Um, then I took a bunch of machinery sounds, did uh, some sound design on that, and created this rhythm. So that actually became almost like a musical beat edited out of like uh, different machine uh, sounds. So these are some of the sound design elements that are uh, added uh, to the suite to, add, to give it like more spice. If we move down, uh, we see uh, some more um, percussion here with uh, sound designs on top. Uh, we can just basically um, play all this uh, solo so you could see how that uh, starts uh, how that how that sounds here we go so 
So that's the combination of all the percussion together. One thing that you notice when you hear this is that it has a really strong rhythm. Ram ta ta tam, bum ta ram ta ta tam. Um, these are things I really like, uh, you know, signature rhythms that constantly come back in a movie. So even when you don't hear the theme and you just hear this rhythm, then it immediately reminds you of this theme. So that's an important thing for me too. Um, so uh, that's the drums right here. Uh, so if I switch this off and we go more down, um, uh, these are taikos. Let's see, here we have a bunch more sound design with uh, guitars and um, we can just solo that for a second and just see what all that stuff is. More piano. Weird drones. Um, it's like some siren guitars are coming in. Um, anyway, some, some droney stuff as, as we, we find here. Uh, and then if I zoom out even more, um, and then go down. So this is where we see all the Ocasio stuff, which we kind of went over. Um, so it's pretty uh, basic. If, if you put it in blocks, like what the writing is, there's uh, uh, the Big Ben with a bunch of sound design. And then there's a cool of bunch little sounds that go with different sections. There's the percussion section that does the rhythm. And, <coughs> excuse me, some droney stuff that then makes up uh, the sound design in the middle. And then we get to the Ocasio stuff, which is, um, uh, just string programming, just woodwinds programming, and then the brass programming. And there's actually also a choir in this um, uh, suite too that we recorded live. Uh, so I just went over like a few of these elements of one aspect of this theme, which is what we also call the ta ta da da theme. Uh, so now I'd like to take you to uh, the mix session and uh, to what it finally became uh, to then play it up. See you in a second. And we're back. Um, on the mixing session of this thing. So the mix session of the suite was so big um, that I had to split it up in seven se uh, separate sections because it was uh, too much what I was, uh, what I was doing. Um, but fine, we're, we have it open. So at this point, we're at the um, Wagner type of iteration of the, of the theme uh, till the end. So I'm going to play the thing uh, last. So um, when we talk about mixing, um, it's not like mixing in the in the traditional sense where you put like so many things uh plugins like on the on the channels um most of that is already done actually on a source level when i uh, make sounds with uh, samplers or with synthesizers or with guitars or with drums and bass uh, on that level most of the processing is being done secondly it's then when you write the cue or you write the suite the sort of session that we had open earlier uh, with a lot of plugins um uh, reverb sense, delay sense, um, weird automation with filters and stuff like that. So once we actually get to this part, uh, that's technically all done. It's also uh, the stems at that point are all ready in quad or in or in surround. Um, so what I'm doing in the mix session is very minor tweaks. Uh, so there's one plugin I want to bring up. Um, I'll discuss this more in uh, separate sessions too, uh, which is um, the BX channel. Uh, which is a plugin uh, released by Plugin Alliance. It's a Brainworks uh, plugin. It's basically uh, a copy of a really old type of console uh, from the 50s and 60s analog. Uh, I think this is a Neve copy, um, but there are uh, a very, a various different models that they have, uh, and you can pick whatever you want. So um, I just opened a random plugin. I don't even know what I opened, but if you go over the plugin, it's actually very simple. It has like a um, um, high pass filter, low pass filter. It has a compressor. It has a, an, an expander uh, slash uh, gate. Um, it has an EQ section, and then it has a couple of controls here. Now, one of the things that's very interesting is that if you were to work on a real analog console with multiple channels, each channel would actually not be the same. It would be slightly different uh, because that's what an analog gear does. And an analog strip, um, there's multiple parts of it. They all might be slightly different. And that's why the sound is great on analog board. So what um, Brainworks did is that they released, um, you know, this, uh, this plugin. So I'm opening now various uh, plugin instances open at the same time. 
Um, and what we see, uh, the first thing that we actually see is that the numbers are different. So we see 22, 63, 46. Now this is something that you can randomize. Um, so you open this plugin on as many channels as you want, and then you press here on all, uh, and it's now randomizing the channels. So now we have 31, 47, and 57. Uh, so what this means is that every instance of this plugin that's being inserted on your mix um, is now actually um, sounding a little bit different. And that little bit different uh, makes it uh, so awesome. Um, so, as you can see, I do very little things here. There's a little bit in the low end EQ that I'm doing here. Uh, there's a little bit on the high end. Um, and there's a little bit of compression happening. Uh, so let's do this proper. Let's now open up uh, the live recordings brass. So I'm just going to scroll down and I'm going to go to my string recordings. And here we have the, the brass recording. So if I solo this, and we just were to listen to this on its own, uh, we're hearing this. Now, if I were to switch all these plugins off, let's play this again. So as you can see, it's not a massive difference, but it is a difference. And the cool thing with this plugin is that if you keep doing it on all your channels, and on this uh, particular queue, we're talking um, roughly 100 tracks or so, what am I looking at? 128, 128 audio tracks. So if you use this plugin 128 times, and there's like little changes like that on every sound, then it makes a really big difference. And that's what it's all about. Um, now, another trick that I used here, I wanted to point out is um, uh, this little thing. And this plugin is from Waves, and I really love this plugin too. Um, and this is the Inface Life uh, Stereo Tool plugin. And what you can do with this is you can do some phase shifting, you can do some little bit of delaying on the left or on the right channel. So if we look at the plugin, uh, what I wanted to achieve here is I wanted the close mics to be a little bit more separated um, than the room mics and the, the surround mics. So I use this plugin for that. And then you can push a, a close mic a little bit more to the right and a little bit more to the left. So um, this is a very interesting plugin uh, to use for that as well. Um, and we can actually open up um, one, of the, one of the BX plugins so we could see how much compression I did. Let's just see. And you can see it, this little light here on the, the bottom. So I'm compressing 3 to 6 dB, uh, which is now keeping the live recording a little bit more in, uh, in, uh, in check. Uh, let's quickly go to uh, the um, strings that play all the crazy runs here. Uh, so let's take all these um, sounds and um, let's just solo those i promise you how much better that would sound than the program guys uh, so perfect example of that also here i used the bx console let's just see what i did here if i did anything weird with compression or something So also here, you see that I did a little bit of um, uh, compression on it and uh, some EQing. Uh, I actually took a little bit of 3K out. So let's, let's see what the difference is between this on and off. So the difference, I'm not sure where you're listening on, but uh, I'm listening on the, the good Dyn Audio uh, studio speakers. So, so for me, there's a clear difference that a little bit around 3K is gone. Uh, and there's a little bit of more 50, 48, 50 hertz pushed like in the lower end when the low strings come in. Um, depending on speaker set that you're listening on, it's, it's, it's there. Um, but 
again, here you see the, the difference in numbers. So if I pull up um, another uh, plugin, you see this is channel 37, uh, 69, and then this is 66 and 67. So um, again, what this does is it makes the sound of each channel slightly different and, and react to certain things like slightly different. So exactly what we want. Okay, so now let's just um, play this section of the suite, which I promised till the end, uh, so you can hear what the final result has become. Did we do live string recording? We have the woodwinds right here, uh, and we have the choir right here. So um, in this particular um, suite, like if you guys have seen other videos that I've done, uh, I would usually always find a balance between like the live guys and um, and the the program guys, um, but in this movie I didn't do it that much. Like I was primarily going for the for the live guys, and um, that has something to do with the fact how it's being played. It was exceptionally well played. It was exceptionally well conducted by uh, uh, Conrad Pope, um, wonderful guy, and his stories are so amazing when you. When you do end up with him uh, at the end of a day at a bar with a martini, which which he loves, I'm a I'm a wine drinker. But nevertheless, <clears throat> um, he had so many interesting insights to make this sound better, and we would actually do that on the stage. So on the recording stage, we didn't do it on forehand. So there were things like if you want this horn line to pop, ba ba da ba 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 da ba like add like a one or two trumpets to it or uh, some top tenor lines um, to really give it that punch and that uh, brassiness. Um, for instance, if you want a, a high trumpet to cut through with a lot of attack, potentially put like a piccolo flute or like an octave higher on top of it. So there were all these little things that we, that we discussed like on the spot to make the sound better of the whole recording. So a lot of it we did actually on the fly during recording uh, which was not mirrored in the in the MIDI at all. Uh, so that also uh, forced the idea to go more with the live recordings than with the, with the samples. There's still certain parts where I use the samples for the really low aggressive string basses. Like the samples have a bite to it and a fullness to it that it's hard to get with live guys until unless you record them separately with close mics and stuff. And similar to some of the lower brass um, elements. So some of these things are still in there with uh, samples, but most of it is actually really live and it, it actually has a, a great quality to it. Okay, let me now play till the end what it has become.
that was it guys i hope you liked this explanation of the london street and everything that i went through from the start until the finish i really hope you liked this episode i'll see you soon for your next one